so much dirt. I would never run out. Good morning, friends, and welcome to Bethlehem Lutheran Church. It is good to be together today, this morning, as we come and and hear our God speak to us anew through his word, through through song. How good it is to be together. I invite you, please, to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is good to be here. It is good to gather together um, with your people in this place. God, what joy it gives us knowing that you meet us here with your true presence as you come and fill us with your grace and with your love once again. God, help us to open our ears, our minds, and our eyes again to hear you and see you as you speak to us through your word and as you meet us in, in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. God, help us to push aside the things that would keep us from experiencing you this morning. God, it's in your precious name, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we gather and that we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to take a moment to stand up and share God's peace with those around you. Praise the Because our sins are many and his mercy is more, we want to confess our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. Almighty Father, 
we admit that we are stuck in a pattern of sinning. We know what you tell us to do. We know what you tell us to avoid. And yet, we ignore your voice and continue to follow our own selfish desires. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to know how we find ourselves trapped in our sin. You come to us, rescue us, and pull us back into the arms of love. Help us to rest assured of your forgiveness and grace as we seek to follow you. We come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And the good news is when we say amen, we are saying, yes, it's true. God has forgiven us all of our sins because his Son has come to live and die for us. And because that is true, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning is Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man and see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. This is the word of the Lord. 
The epistle lesson is Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. We stand together for the reading of Holy Gospel, which this morning comes from St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith. We tell the story of our faith in the words of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The end from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus and his disciples are, you know, having lunch at some open bistro. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the, uh, the scribes, the, the legal eagles, if you will, they are, you know, standing there and they see Jesus and the guys eating. 
And just like my dear mother used to say, you didn't wash your hands. You're going to die of germs. Yes, you are. Yes. Everybody knows, right, that the Bible says over and over and over again that cleanliness is next to godliness, right? Oh, the first service beat you guys. Of course it does not say that anywhere. Who said that? The guy that was flying a kite out in a thunderstorm with lightning and he's hoping that he's going to get electrocuted and he probably did, which made his hair look so weird. Benjamin Franklin said that. God didn't. The problem is that we tend to take words that people say and try to make them into God's words and we take the the laws that God has given to us the the plans that he has for us the will that he has for us and we turn them into ours and when they don't fit guess what we do we change them we change them to fit what we want teacher Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? The problem was not their unclean hands. The problem was the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees and the other religious elite. That was the problem. The tradition, the Human creations, the social laws established for the most part to help remember important ideas, that's what traditions are. When, when we hear or when we're at, you know, at a ball game or something and they play the national anthem, what is our tradition? We stand, yeah, we take off our baseball hat, we stand, and hopefully we know the words to the song and we sing. Tradition. National anthem, stand. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a thing. That's what we do. The tradition of the elders was something tremendously different. Human traditions of the elders were egotistically pointing to themselves so that the public might honor their greatness of religious purity. I hate to say even the word. They even dressed with these special dressings so that people could look at them and know that they were special. I try to dress like that and my wife laughs at me. But that's what they did because they were such arrogant, ignorant people. And to be fair, to be fair, the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 30, you shall make a basin of bronze for for washing, and you should put it in between the tent of meeting and the altar, the tent of meeting being sort of the temple while they were traveling through the desert. Put this basin there, and you shall put water in it, with which the priest... Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord. They shall wash with water so that they may not die. Pretty clear. When you're coming into the Lord's presence to to perform a work that he has given to you, wash your hands. Later on, the religious leaders wanted to be, you know, improving on God's say. So they changed the law to say that all Jews must wash in order to, frankly, encourage the lazy priests who didn't bother washing their hands into washing them. Look, the simple people wash their hands. You guys should too. But the... um, The oral law at that time, which 
was known as the Mishnah, and it was later written down for good keeping. The Mishnah says there was one more addition to this tradition as far as washing your hands. And I'm sorry, parents, to say this in front of the kids. You can close their ears. The new law said <clears throat> you must wash your hands after urinating. Well, my mother said the same thing. And if you go into the public restroom at McDonald's, it still says the same thing. It's not a bad thing, but it was added to God's words. It had no business being in there. Psalm 114, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. But they've all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. When teachers teach in error the way of the Lord, people die. When teachers try to teach you things that are not in God's word or in his will, they will die eternally. You're teaching them wrong things. That's why there is such incredible caution in our pastoral call here in the process. The man that we call should understand and faithfully practice and teach God's word without adding anything to it. God has given us everything that we need to know. I said uh, earlier this morning in the class on call process 101, which I love the name, when I was considering going into ministry, and this is a second um, vocation for me, I was, I was a very young 47 when I went to seminary and I before I went I debated and debated and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and you know I thought yeah Lutherans are pretty smart and I'm not looking at anybody here but Lutherans have managed to take the word of God and say yeah that's it don't mess with it we broke from all of the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church at the time because traditions were pretty much the whole game plan. And Luther said, no, that's not God's game plan. That's your game plan. So I decided, you know, traditions are good except for when they're not. God's word is perfect, and it's always perfect. The Lutherans, they got it better than most others. And that's what I'm comfortable with. And that's what your next pastor should be comfortable with. All God's people need to understand the difference between tradition and God's words. Then, after I was ordained, I quickly decided the thing that I really hate about ministry is weddings. Sorry, dear. Not talking about you. <laughs> weddings. The tradition. Ephesians 5. It's the epistle lesson. I'm surprised that the women sitting out there didn't throw something. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Right? Oh, some of you are just sitting out there waiting. <laughs> yeah. I, it, I went for it. In pre-marriage counseling, you know, I... I said, this is the text that I'm going to read as part of your wedding ceremony. And the bride-to-be would say, no, you're not. You read that, and I'm out of here. And when I read it, 
she was not only out of there, she and he were out of the church. That's offensive. That's a, an offensive thing. And I, I thought after a while, you know, that's a tradition. It is the word of God, but the way we're applying it is a tradition. And what comes out of that tradition is us men know more than these silly women. Therefore, we are going to smack them if they make any bad decisions, and we're going to tell them what to do, and they better do it. Right? How much do you love that, women? Oh, look at that. She, wow, I'm, I love you. You're just... Oh, your face is even matching the color of your sweater. I'm sorry. And women say... Did you? Did you get... I won't spoil it. I'll do you one better. I, I want to meet the guy who came up with just that verse. And I thank God that you are faithful enough to the word of the Lord that you got it. But to simplify things, I decided, hey, why not just add the one verse that comes before that? It says... Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it comes, verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husband. Husbands, submit to your wife by dying for her as Christ did for the bride in the church. I love my wife and my wife tolerates me even when I'm sort of a dingbat. But the word says, hey, Phil, even though you try to give direction in your marriage, don't forget, you should be ready to take a bullet for Cheryl. You should be ready to do what Jesus did, to die for her, to die for the church. And it's that clarity that, that helps me. And I'm sincerely happy. See, you're smarter than I am. I need to... All right. Teacher, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders? Jesus quoted Isaiah. The people honor me with their lips, but their, their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines that they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. So, again... The tradition of that verse blessed you, and I thank God for that. The minute you start to teach something else and twist it around, then you're in trouble. So what about traditions? As I said before, traditions of men are good until they're bad. But the good traditions help us remember the pure will of God for every one of us who believe. For example, when we begin our service, many of us make the sign of the cross. It's a tradition. Why do we do it? Well, it helps me to remember who I belong to. In the font of baptism, I was marked with the cross. It's a tradition. Nobody said we have to do that. Traditions of men are helpful when they clearly point us to Jesus Christ, the Savior, the author and perfecter of our faith. Telling the story of our faith. We read the Apostles' Creed, we, we speak the Apostles' Creed most every Sunday. If it's not the Apostles' Creed, it's the Nicene Creed. Why do we do that? It's a tradition. Nobody said you had to do that. But the tradition is good. Because we state and restate and tell the story so that we can memorize things that we can then later go out and tell to others. I believe in who? God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus. 
And I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's training. It's review. It's a good tradition. Some traditions, some practices for us are clearly stated in Scripture. And these are good. Listen to this. Things like singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's a good thing. When you're just so cranked up and blessed by the Lord. Sing to him. Even if you have a bad voice, sing anyway. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Practice these things. Yeah, they're traditions. And they're good. They're holy. Because God has written that we should do them. When the church does have traditions... Some of them are sort of weird. Did you ever hear, I'm sure you have. Do you know how many Lutherans it takes to change a light bulb? None. We don't change light bulbs here. When, when we get into that mode of thinking, you need to really kick back and think about what you're believing. I happen to think that a true and faithful tradition that serves everyone is coffee. Coffee before, after, and between worship services. If I could bring a coffee in without spilling it, I would do that too. Wonderful things. And it's a tradition that you have here. It's great because we get to sit and share with each other what's going on. How's your life doing? How can I be praying for you? Can I get you some more coffee? Yes, please. Bethlehem, the bride of Christ. Change here is coming very soon because a new pastor is coming very soon. And the reality of pastors is that pastors come and go as God sees fit to move them from one place to another. As he chooses to use them, there they go. Church members come and go too. We die. We move to a different city. Nothing remains the same as God changes, but God's changes are perfect the only thing that matters during this transition period is to be steady in God's word. Don't mangle it with your own thinking. Think, but accept what the Lord says. Pray, not for what you want, but for what the Lord wants. Serve, love one another. Take care of one another. Forgive one another. Be generous with one another. Be here for one another. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Man, I would say it's a darn good thing. And I... While I'm here, you can throw things at me if you want. <laughs> I said it before. This is like the coolest church on the face of the earth. And I'm having so much fun and enjoying myself here. I'm spoiled. And your new pastor will too. Your new pastor is going to love you like you've never been loved before. Stick with the word of God. Trust him. Trust him completely. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'd like to ask the ushers to come and accept our gifts to the Lord. Thank you. 
Then stand with me and join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you, your word is clear and your word is perfect and it gives life. Lord, we ask you to keep us in your word, reading your word, digesting your word, taking it in, into ourselves and allowing you to grow the words of faith in us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we, we pray for Zoe and Eric Godsey um, in their time of need, their time of wanting us to lift them up to you with whatever the, the question is, whatever the issue is, they look to you, and we simply ask you to provide for them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the Middle East, where the escalation and tension are getting worse between Israel and Lebanon and the other countries there. Lord, this is not pleasing to you, obviously. And we have no idea how it's going to end or how to end it, but you do. And we simply put that situation in your hands and ask for, for your blessing according to your perfect will. We also ask, Lord, for blessings on our own country, that you reunite us in bonds of peace and brotherly love. Lord, in your mercy, we also ask, Lord, and pray for our new pastor here at Bethlehem. We pray for him and for his family, if he has a family. Lord, we, we trust that you know what is best for the pastor and for your bride, the church here at Bethlehem. And we, we simply ask you to bless him as he considers whether his work is finished at his own church or not that he will or he will not accept the call. And Lord, we, we, we absolutely trust that you know what's best for us. And so we ask you, Lord, to give us patience and trust in you. And we ask you to teach us, Lord, again and again and again how to pray and pray seriously, to pray with trust that you are leading us. Lord, in your mercy... And Lord, we ask you to hear us as we simply pray the words that your Son has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom <clears throat> and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup when he had finished eating, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink from this cup, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my shed blood, which will be given for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Just as
you stand with me? Now may the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you unto life everlasting. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you with his favor and give you peace. Amen.
You may be seated. I realize today's sermon was a little bit controversial, so I wanted to read from you uh, James chapter 4, verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. So uh, the official position of Bethlehem Lutheran Church is that you do wash your hands after using the bathroom. I wanted that to be clear. Uh, then we've got uh, call process 101 took place today. It will continue for adults uh, next Sunday in the community center. Tonight, uh, youth were meeting over at Bella and Karen's house. Uh, we're having tacos and doing improv and doing a devotional thought and whatnot. So come with your appetites. If you do not have the address, you can talk to them. They probably know where they live. Uh, or you can talk to me, and I will be getting a text out soon on that. Uh, that's for those in 6th or 12th grade. I think I covered that. And then uh, rally day is not next Sunday. Next Sunday is Labor Day weekend. The following, I'm told, is September 8th. And that will be one worship service at 10 o'clock here. But afterwards, we're having a potluck. And so there's a sign-up sheet for that. We will have pulled pork. But we're looking for sides and things that go along with that. Um, and then, I f- was there another announcement? I feel like there was one. No, there wasn't? Okay. Very good. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. One, two. Three.